This is flipped classroom lecture number four, and which is the last one for chapter one. This is going to cover section 1.6. If you look at section 1.6, it's actually a simplification of what you've been doing so far. It's gonna, we've been doing all this motion in two or in principle even three dimensions. He's going to cut it down to one dimension and that dimension is either going to be horizontal or vertical. Now there are actually two sections after 1.6. Those two sections are 1.7 which are this called um, strategies for doing physics problems, solving problems in physics, and 1.8 which is units and significant figures. I am not going to devote any time to that specifically. You'll see all the time we're doing strategies for solving physics problems. And you'll watch, already I'm using units, and you'll watch me introduce more units, and you'll watch, you'll see how I use significant figures in scientific notation, and it might be a mistake, but I'm going to presume that we can just work that in, learn by doing, rather than devoting um, time to those as specific uh, topics of their own. So, motion in one dimension. The dimension can either be horizontal or alternatively it can be vertical. Now Knight promises you at the bottom of one page that if he makes it horizontal he'll call it X and he'll make the increasing X direction to the right. And if it's vertical, he'll call it Y and make the increasing Y direction up. Uh, I think that's expecting less of you than you are capable of. Coordinate systems are arbitrary. And understanding that they're arbitrary is something to get early on. So don't always assume that X points right and Y turns points up. It's whatever's convenient for the problem at hand. Okay, so let's suppose that we have something that is moving horizontally. Let's suppose this is a car accelerating from a stop sign and then hitting a brick wall. So here is the car at time zero. At time one, it's only a little bit farther away. At time two, since it's accelerating, that is, it's picking up speed, that might increase a little bit. In time three, that might increase a little more. Time four, that might increase a little more. Now let's suppose that's the top speed, so at time five, and times six, just before it reaches the wall, it's going at this top speed. And then finally it hits the wall and comes immediately to a halt. So time seven is more or less right smack on top of time six. And so is time eight and time nine and time 10 and 11 until the fire department and the paramedics arrive. Okay, so that would be an example of motion in one dimension. Of course, we can set up the coordinates and we can be nice and set them up in the direction that Knight did. Uh, we can even um, set up the coordinates so that the zero position is at x equals zero. So this could be uh, the zeroth position at x equals zero. That might be nice of us. Now we've spent a lot of time already on vectors and all of a sudden the problem is going to get substantially simpler. This motion in one dimension, when we had a vector, if it was in three dimensions, then you had to say the x value of the particle at time zero, the y value of the particle at time zero, and if you were in three dimensions, you even had to say a z value of the particle at time zero. And that would be 
a vector that we would call R0. And then you have to do all that again at time one. And all that again at time two, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, and in this problem, you'd have to do that all the way up to uh, time six and seven, wherever you want to cut this off, let's say seven. So six was just before it hit, and seven was just after it hit. So you'd have to do this all the way up to R6 and R7. Now, we've been making, taking most of our examples in this course. We've been taking uh, only 2D. So all of a sudden, you're down to this. That's an improvement at least as far as the amount of labor is concerned. Now, so what Knight's saying is, in this last section of 1.6 of, of chapter one that we're covering, um, he's gonna make your life even easier. He's gonna say, I'm either gonna have X or Y, but not both. So all of a sudden, all this vector notation, which we introduced because we needed multiple numbers to describe a particle of a position, a particle's position at any given time, all of a sudden, all this extra notation about vectors becomes extremely simple. It's gone. We just have x naught, x one, and x two all the way down in our example here to x seven. We still have time, of course, so each of these corresponds to a time, and each of them has a time separation, so we still have delta t to deal with. But now look how easy our displacements are. Our, dis our delta x sub 0 is no longer a vector. It's just x1 minus x0. Our delta x sub 1 is just x2 minus x1. Our delta x sub dot dot dot, our delta x sub 6 is x7 minus x6. And then our v naught, our v1, and our v6 are just those things divided by the time. So that's the position difference divided by the time difference. Look at that. And once again, not only do the positions have no vector components anymore, but the velocities have no com vector components anymore. Okay, well, in this problem, once you've got v naught to v6, which that's how you get it, once you have v naught to v6, well, then I can define a naught to a5. The acceleration at time zero is by definition the velocity at time one minus the velocity at time zero divided by the time. The acceleration at time one is equal to the velocity at two minus the velocity of one divided by the time. The velocity, the acceleration at time two is v3 minus v2 over delta t. Dot, 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 the acceleration at time five is v6 minus v5 over delta t. And just like position was now no longer a vector, it's just a number, and velocity is now no longer a vector, it's just a number, the accelerations are no longer vectors. This is a huge simplification, okay? And it's often it's such a simplification that physics books often start out with this. Okay, so we have pretty well covered the motion in one dimension case. Just one more thing I really wanna show you, which is if I have a bunch of values of x, or a bunch of values of a, or a bunch of value of v, or a bunch of values of a, like I have x naught dot 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 to x7, or I have v naught dot 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 to v6, or I have a naught dot 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 to a5. If I have a bunch of values, well, I can graph them, okay? So the simplest graph here, 
might be to graph x as a function of time. So this is a motion diagram. This is x as a function of time. Uh, time on the horizontal axis. Now this gets weird. Time on the horizontal axis, because it's the independent variable. And now all of a sudden, even though x represents a horizontal direction, for the graph that is x as a function of time, x goes on the vertical axis. And so let's look at this problem here. What happened? Well, at t equals 0, the particle was at x equals 0. At t equals 1, the particle had gone up by that much. At t equals 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, we're going to graph the rest of these points. At t equals 2, the particle has now gone to this position. At t equals 3, the particle has now gone to that position. Wow. At t equals 4, the particle has gone the whole length of my arm. At t equals 5, it's got my length of my arm plus one hand. At t equals 6, it's gone the length of my arm plus a good fraction of the length of another arm. So it's gone from there. Pretty well topped out, okay? t equals 6, it's gone all the way up to there. And at t equals 7, what a silly thing, came to a complete halt and is now stuck at that distance from the origin. So t equals 7 is right there. So I'm gonna, let me just get... Let me just clean this board up so that you can see what, I, what I, has been revealed here. There is, for this car accelerating away from a stop sign, and picking up a maximum speed, and then crashing into a brick wall, there is x as a function of t. Well, I think that's a, enough for you to wade in to section 1.6, uh, then I do think, even though I'm not going to personally spend time on it, um, it's really good to step back and see what Knight has to say about solving and problems in physics. And if you do sort of like have doubts about your uh, unit conversions and uh, kinds of units that are used in college level courses, uh, definitely uh, look at 1.8. See you tomorrow.